to go deeper? You want to get off the shore? You want to stretch your wings a little bit? You know, David the psalmist felt like that often. You can read the psalms and you can just tell he's longing for God. He wants more and more. And one of the psalms that I found really interesting was Psalm 107. And this is what he says. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out in the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, the wonderful deeds in the deep. If you go back and read through that again, as I'm going to do right now, he describes the entire Christian experience in those few short verses. Verse 19, we cry out to the Lord in our trouble. That moment where you realize that only hope you have for a real meaning and purpose in life is a relationship with the God that created that life. Verse 19, we cry out to the Lord in our trouble. He saves us. Verse 20, he sends his word and we are healed. Verse 20, again, he rescues us from the grave. Verse 21, we give thanks to the Lord for his love and his kindness. Verse 22, we tell others of his great deeds. Does that not describe the Christian life? But the last thing he says, but only a few people see his wonders in the deep. Do you ever get tired of living in the shallow end of life? Do you ever get tired of living where there is no challenge? I remember when I was a little boy, this like 18, 19 years ago, um, I would spend all day, summer days, at the public swimming pool. You're too young to work back there. There really wasn't much to do, and we would spend all day at the pool. When I was very young, I took swimming lessons. And I'd be down there at the shallow end, the little kiddie pool, and I'd always look down at the other end of the, of the pool, watching the big kids at the deep end. And they'd be diving off the board. They'd be splashing and laughing and playing. And I can remember thinking to myself, I want to go down there. I want to go down there. That's where all the fun is. That's where all the action is. The deep end is so much more fun than the shallow end. And then one day, the swimming instructor told us, today's the day you get to go to the deep end. At first I said, oh boy, and then I said, oh no. <laughs> it's scary at the deep end. There are dangers there that you don't find in the shallow end of the pool. You can't really drown in a foot of water, but you can drown in 15 feet of water. And I remember walking to the deep end that day. I looked like a man walking to the electric chair, you know. I stood at the bottom of the diving board. I looked up, and it was only 10 steps. And then I got up on that board, and I looked down, and it grew. I, it felt like I was 50 feet in the air. And I realized then that the deep end looked more fun when somebody else was diving in. It was more entertaining to watch them than to have to dive in myself. But I didn't want my friends to make fun of me for being afraid. You know, some things fear stops you from doing, and other things fear makes you do. Well, fear of ridicule overcame my fear of dying. And so I jumped. I jumped off the board. And you know what? After that day, I was never satisfied to stay in the shallow end again. You're thinking, what's this have to do with the message? Well, not much. I'm just a little short of material. I'm trying to stretch this out a little bit. I'm going to come back to this, but think about, that, think about that video and what I just shared. You know, the historians tell us that probably seven of the original 12 disciples were all fishermen. I thought maybe it's because fishermen have the general qualities that make good Christians. I mean, think about it. Courage and risk-taking. The sea is dangerous at times. There's problems out on the open sea, storms and sharks and everything else. You had to be willing to have some courage and take some risks. They had patience and determination. Anybody who's ever fished know it takes patience and determination. They had faith. They lived day to day. They had discipline because if they didn't fish, they weren't going to eat. They had self-motivation. Nobody was there waking them up in the morning. They got up before, before dawn to go out on the sea, and they had a willingness to work together because cooperation was vital to their success. So if you think about it, fishermen have a lot of the same qualities that are necessary for Christians to have. The most famous fisherman of the group was Simon Peter, and one day, a day just like 
any other day and every other day, everything changed for Peter. And it happened the day that Jesus boarded Peter's boat. And the story's found in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or whatever that is, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. Jesus asked Peter to put out a little bit from shore so he could use his boat. The crowd was so big that probably they couldn't all hear what he was saying, so he had to be out there in the shallow water in Peter's boat preaching. And when he was done, he says, Peter, now put out into the deep water. Peter had a lot of reasons why that wasn't a good idea. They were fishermen, and he was a carpenter. They knew what they were doing. They, they fished close to the shore because of the storms that would arise so quickly. And they fished at night so the fish wouldn't see their nets. And here it is in the broad daylight, and he wants them to go out into the deep water. They fished all night and caught nothing. That's the only true fish story that's ever been told. <laughs> They're tired from working all night. They still have their nets that they have to wash and their boats that they have to clean. There are plenty of reasons not to set sail. But if they were going to receive God's blessing, they couldn't rely on common sense all the time. They couldn't rely on past experiences. They couldn't rely on popular opinion. They had to have the attitude that Peter exhibits when he said, because you say so, we will. That's all he needed. So they set sail into the deep waters, and there in the deep, after obeying Jesus' command, a net-breaking, boat-sinking blessing took place. And it wasn't just a blessing given to Peter because Peter called out his friends in the other boat and both boats almost sank with fish. Thank goodness they were willing to cooperate, willing to work together. How much would have been lost if they had been unwilling to work together? Peter's boat would have sunk. He would have lost his boat, lost that catch. But because of working together, locking arms, laboring together, both boats and both crews were blessed. And as soon as Peter got on shore and he realized what he just witnessed, he also realizes something else, how unworthy he is to even be in Jesus' presence. That's why he said, go away, I'm a sinful man. But then he took note of the blessing <laughs> that being in Jesus' presence brought. And I think that's when it changed for Peter. I think that's when everything changed for Peter. You know, Romans says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindnesses lead you toward repentance? I think that was the moment that Peter, the fisherman, met Jesus, the Messiah. I think that's the moment his life changed. And Peter, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, this is just the beginning. You're still going to be a fisherman but now you're going to be a fisher of men. And we're told that they left everything and they followed Jesus. And I noticed they didn't wait or didn't need to hit rock bottom before they looked heavenward, crying out to God. I mean, think about it. This was the catch of a lifetime. This was a fisherman's dream. They're not desperate and at their wit's end. They embraced Jesus when probably the best day of fishing they ever experienced. Now, it seems like a simple story. It seems like a short story. But I want us to look at some of the practical aspects of this story, some of the spiritual truths found in this story. First, Peter would have missed the blessing in the deep waters if he hadn't first put out a little from the shore. If Peter said, you know, Jesus, you can't use my boat. I'm tired. I've been up all night. I still got to clean my boat. I got to wash the nets. 
find someplace else to preach. But the Bible says the one who is faithful with little, much more will be given. And that's demonstrated in this. He was in the deep because he first was in the shallow. He was given a great blessing because he obeyed the first command that he got from Jesus. And God's blessing to Peter required several different things. There were several components, if you will, to this. I don't want to call it a miracle because people catch a lot of fish all the time, but it's certainly a blessing. And there were several components to that blessing. First, obedience, letting Jesus use his boat to preach. The second thing was stepping out in faith, that is sailing out to the deep waters, even when it wasn't the wisest thing to do. The third thing was cooperation, because like I said, all would have been lost without the other boat's help. And that's usually the case with God's blessings. There's several components. There's obedience, being willing to step out in faith, being willing to work with other members of the body of Christ, being a part of the bride of Jesus, serving one another, encouraging one another, challenging one another, protecting one another, warning one another. All those things were necessary for this one blessing to take place. Another practical spiritual truth is the real adventure is happening out in the deep waters. You know, if the truth were known, most of us spend our lives living close to shore in the shallow waters, taking no risks, embracing no challenges, experiencing no change, and benefiting from no adventure, just throwing our nets in the same old place. And it's so easy to watch other people in the deep end and say, I wish I was doing the things that they're doing. We read people, about people in the Bible doing great exploits, serving God's purpose in their generation, stepping out in faith, sacrificing, doing all those things, and we admire them. We call them the heroes of the faith. And it's easier to think that somehow they were more qualified to do that or more equipped or more godly than any of us are, it's easy to just applaud them and not try to follow their example. We see people in the news that we admire. We see other people in the church. Man, I wanna, I wanna be like that guy. I wanna preach like this guy. I wanna pray like that person. I wanna serve and sacrifice like they are over there. You know what? We're all just a decision away. We're all just a decision away. It's just a matter of setting sail. We're all gonna have the opportunity to do that today. And what I'm talking about is setting sail, heading for the deep, getting out of the shallow end of life, moving into deeper things like thinking, faith instead of doubt. It's so easy to doubt. Sometimes we need to doubt our doubt. Like, why am I thinking that God wouldn't or couldn't do this? Replace doubt with faith. Replace fear with courage. And courage isn't the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing in the midst and in spite of the fear that you feel. Deeper thinking like positive instead of negative. It's, uh, people think they have the gift of discouragement. Everything's negative. You know, you could see God do great things and they would explain it away as science or medical or this or that. Move deeper in our thinking, deeper in our praying. And I'm, not, I'm talking about not just a shopping list of prayer. I get so frustrated with myself because I find myself going over the same shopping list over and over and over. And I realize that I've asked God for all these things, but I've not spent any time with Him. The conversation was gimme, 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 gimme. Deeper in our prayers, like not so self-centered. The Bible says pray for one another daily, not just small requests. When was the last time you you had a prayer that kind of went like this? God, show your stuff. Show us what you can do. Do exceedingly abundantly more than we've asked or could even imagine. Let's move deeper in our thinking, deeper in our praying, deeper in our serving. Not just random acts of service, not just occasional acts of service. Let service be massaged in the regular routine of your life to where you are a walking servant who actually serves. Gift-based service, passion-based service, because that's the way God wired you up. Some things get you all fired up that doesn't get anybody else fired up. God put that in you because he wanted someone just like you to do what your gift and your passion drives you to do. Let's move deeper into our commitments, our commitment to obedience. My obedience so oftentimes is is built around convenience or the mood I'm in at the time. That's not deep obedience. Deep obedience is, is when it costs you something. 
our commitment to trust God, our commitment to righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's a deeper commitment. That's out in the deep waters of Christianity. And let's go deeper in our relationships, first with God. Like I said, not just a, a, a celestial butler to go get us things and do things that we want him to do, but I'm talking about a relationship with God, intimacy, a knowledge of God, deeper in our relationships together with one another, deeper in our relationship to the, this church. God put us all here together. You know why? Because he wanted us all together. And he put us in this church. You know why? Because he wanted us in this church. We're the best church in the world. I told you before, we're probably not the best church in Redlands. But it's ours. It's our church. And God put us here together because he wants us to rub shoulders. Iron sharpening iron and one man sharpening the countenance of another. What would happen if we left here today saying, I'm done in the shallow end of life. I'm going to move out into the deep. I'm going to go deeper in my thinking deeper in my praying, deeper in my serving, deeper in my commitments, and deeper in my relationships. I think that's what God intends for us. And then I want to look at the last statement of this portion of Scripture that we read and told in this story where it says, they left everything and followed Jesus. You know, you can't follow Jesus unless you do leave everything. Jesus talked about that and taught that several different places in the, in the New Testament. One of them is in the same book. Luke chapter 14, he said, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. There's no wiggle room there. Any of you who doesn't give up everything cannot be my disciple. They knew that. And that's why they left everything. You have to ask yourself, what made them get up, leave everything, and follow Jesus? I mean, were they just hungrier spiritually than we are? Maybe it's because they were spiritual giants. Well, Peter admitted he was a great sinner when he asked Jesus to lead him. These are sailors. I don't think they were pillars of society, and they didn't have real flowery speech, I'll bet, either. They weren't spiritual giants. They didn't lack responsibility. They had families to support, just like all of us do. It's not like they got bored of life one day. They had a life. They had relationships and friendships and work. You know why they got up, left everything, and followed Jesus? Because they were sick of the way their life was. They wanted something more than they had up to that moment in their life. And they were willing to pay the price to get it. And it wasn't hitting rock bottom. Like I said, it was the best day of work they've ever had, and that's the day they walked away from the work they had. Because they wanted more in life. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, in Jesus' day, that was easy. That was clear. You got up, you left everything, you went where he went, watched what he did, and you followed his example. That's what they did to follow Jesus. But today, following Jesus has more to do than just getting up and walking behind him wherever he goes. Today, following Jesus means becoming like Jesus, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ being transformed into His image. Who do you really want to emulate? Who do you really want to be like? Remember the commercial years ago, Be Like Mike, about Michael Jordan? Who do you want to be like? Have you ever asked yourself that? Who do you want to be and why do you want to be that? Now, unfortunately, we're in a church, so everybody already knows the, automatically the right answer, who we want to be like. I remember hearing a story about a, a little Sunday school class and and the teacher was trying to give them a lesson on hard work. And there in the Sunday school class, the teacher said, okay, who's gray and furry with a bushy tail and stores up nuts for winter? And one little boy in the back of the class says, well, I suppose the answer is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> when I say, who do you want to be like? Well, we're in church. You know who, what the right answer is. But do you really want that? Is that an accurate representation of the desire of your heart? Do you want to be like him? Because that's the goal of every true follower of Jesus, is to be like Jesus. Matthew 10, Jesus said, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. And that doesn't mean just gritting your teeth and trying harder. You know... Every New Year's, everybody makes New Year's resolutions, it's like they get this motivation to make some changes in their life. 
and they just, they're determined, I'm going to do it this year, and I'm going to, they grit their teeth, and I'm going to, I'm I'm going to try harder, and I'm going to become who I really should have been all along and really wanted to be, but never was. And that usually lasts about a day. You know, being like Jesus doesn't mean just gritting your teeth and trying harder. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, a student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. He's saying not trying harder, training. Putting forth the effort and the discipline to prepare yourself and train. How many people here right now could run a marathon? We, we, there's not a liar in the room. How many could run a marathon if you made some minor changes? You know, you walked up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. How many people think marathon runners should be locked up? <laughs> could you run a marathon if you just really decided to and really tried hard? No, you couldn't. The only way you can run a marathon is if you train to run a marathon. The same thing is true when it comes to being like Jesus. Paul told the Corinthians, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul told Timothy, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Training means discipline. And in this case, training to be like Jesus requires spiritual discipline. I mean, think about it. The last time some of the other guys have, have taught recently, what did they talk about? What did Pastor Rob talk about? Prayer reading scriptures, not to get through the chapter, but to, to get understanding and knowledge, and, and that's God communicating to us. Prayer is us communicating to God. Fellowship in church, fasting. These are the spiritual disciplines that train us to be righteousness. Discipline is something that I do by effort that enables me to do what I currently can't do by effort. It's growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to pray what the psalmist prayed. In Psalm 119, he said, Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. We have to be taught. And I don't just mean this kind of teaching. Experience and other people and failure. All those things are the mentors and teachers that teach us. All those things that we've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. They are preparing us to succeed sometime in the future. But I think too often we just think that by osmosis over time we're just going to become more like Jesus. And that's not true. If anything, the opposite is true. When you first cross that line of faith and become a Christian, you're going off adrenaline. Your gratitude level is off the chart. You're amazed at God and everything, you know. So aware of His presence in your life because you were so uh, soon removed from that time where you didn't feel Him in your life. But over time, things get ordinary. And we settle in. And things that used to cause us to be grateful, now we kind of have a mentality of entitlement. Like, well, yeah, of course God's going to bless me. Because I don't do this and I don't do that and I'm different than I was and everything else. We think over time we're just going to get better at this thing called Christianity. And it requires discipline. And it requires effort. And, and, and it requires training. If you do, if you will do that, if you will embrace the concept of training yourself to be more like Jesus, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, getting out of the shallow end, going into the deep, then this is what Jesus promised Peter. And when he put it in the Bible, he made the promise to all of us too. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. uh, Verse 29 of Luke chapter 18, I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus made that promise. You're not going to outgive the giver of life. Nobody can outgive God. And he says he's going to be a debtor to no one. So the harder you train, the more discipline you exert, the more energy you invest into becoming like Jesus, who gets the reward of that? We do. 
The Bible is clear. True life is found only in a life spent with Jesus, spent becoming more like Jesus. Listen to these verses. John 1, in him, Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. 1 John 5, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Ephesians, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. John 10, therefore Jesus again said, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. So here's the challenge. Are you going to stay in the shallow end of life? Are you going to set sail for the deep waters? Determine today that you're not going to settle for a shallow spiritual life. No more quick prayers, thoughtless, heartless prayers, just rote, mechanical things. No more of those. No more short chapters at night just to get rid of the, check off the, the requirement that you had to read the Bible today. No more occasional church services. You know, church services come once a week, and most Christians don't. Don't settle for a shallow spiritual life. Quick prayers, short chapters, and occasional church. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two, determine that beginning today, obedience to God will be your highest priority. No matter how difficult it might be, no matter what the cost, and no matter the outcome, I can't tell you how many times I've, I disobey God because it's not going to do any good anyway. I'll feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do something. Oh, it, it's not going to matter. No, determine today. Beginning today, obedience will be your highest priority no matter how difficult, no matter the cost, and no matter the outcome. Determine today that you will set sail for the deep waters even if nobody else in the room goes with you. Even when you're afraid of the dangers and the uncertainty out there and even those times where it really kind of doesn't make sense. And then determine today that you will commit to the body of Christ, cooperating together to receive God's blessings, cooperating together to be a blessing to other people, and cooperating together to be fishers of men. It's all of our responsibility. None of us can do it without the rest of us the way God wants it done. Some people will get something done, but we can all get more done if we do it together. Determine today you're not going to stay in the shallow end, You're going to set sail for the deep waters. Obedience is going to be your highest priority and that you commit to Jesus by committing to his bride. And if you do that, then this story will be your story. That's the promise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we become so comfortable in the shallow end. I pray, God, that those days would be over, that there would be a longing in our hearts that that make us want to set sail, that make us want to pursue you and the deep things of God, the deep relationship with Jesus, the deep Christianity that we've admired so often and for so long in other people. God, I pray that you would create in us a dissatisfaction of staying in the shallow end. And I pray, God, that you would motivate us to move toward the deep things of God. And I pray, God, that you would give us the type of uh, lack of, of satisfaction that would cause us to leave everything and follow you. I pray these things in Jesus' name.